Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus the Christ. At the picnic, we started a small series because of the theme of the picnic was bringing those ways all together. And when I heard of that and was advised by Elizabeth, that was the theme that she was thinking about, I immediately thought about several texts in Scripture, and last week we looked at one of those. The first text that we looked at was from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, where Paul likens the life of the Christian, the follower of Christ, as one who is in a race. And in that particular passage, Paul is telling the followers in Corinthians, in Corinthia, you have to understand, he's saying, that if it is possible for a person to run a race in the Olympics, or perhaps in the Olympian, Games, if it is possible for a man, and what women were allowed, for a man to participate in a race and discipline himself in order to participate at his maximum best, then how much more should we as Christians participate and be this self disciplined? Because they are only seeking a perishable goal, whereas we are seeking an imperishable goal. Well, what does that mean? Is this just another encouragement, another self-help book calling us to be more self-disciplined? I tell you, that's one of the most difficult areas in my life. It's very difficult for me to be self-disciplined. I'd much rather eat that cookie today and find another cookie tomorrow. It's just the way I can build. And I no longer make excuses. Karen just hides me. It's become a game. In the meantime, she hikes the candy and I find it. And self-discipline is very hard. But, but the Bible doesn't just have a self-help instruction book. It has more. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. And we'll take a look at the 12th chapter of Hebrews, the verses 1, 2, and 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, remember in Hebrews, the that chapter, the writer of Hebrews has identified so many people who were a cloud of witnesses for us to find. Instead of great cloud of witnesses, witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We're going to be taking a look at that, and we're going to be doing that by looking at three stories, three, three Olympic stories, that I think will help us hopefully to grapple with this text in a way that will become meaningful for us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have a great crowd of, cloud of witnesses here. And we ask that you make us aware of the fact that others are watching. But help us also, also to recognize that we can watch the people in our congregation. Not as a way of holding them accountable or criticizing them, but the example for which they have been living. And you can see how they have lived their lives for you. Challenge us, however not to remain where we are, but to run the race in a way that will make a difference for us and for others. In your name we pray. Amen. In 1952, I was a ten-year-old boy in Germany. And if you'd come to Lokamstrasse, where I was living, there was a little park there, you would have seen me and a whole bunch of other kids running around. And we were running around like crazy because we were convinced that we could be the next Zatopek, Emil Zatopek. The 1952 Olympics in Helsinki brought forth a true hero for many people from Czechoslovakia. And Emil Zatopek not only won the 5,000 meter, the 10,000 meter, but he also won the marathon, and nobody has ever done that in one Olympics. And one of the things that you would have noticed by, or if you watched by any of us, is that we were running in the same way that Emil Zuckerberg was running. I love the way that name sounds. Emil Zuckerberg. 
In fact, they named a train after him, a locomotive after him, because he was such a runner and such a strong athlete. But he had a habit that was not particularly welcomed by many people. But we as kids all imitated him. We ran with our tongues sticking out. And just watch this. <laughs> we would run. Anybody who runs at all knows that that's the worst thing that you can do because your tongue starts to dry out and you have a difficult time. But here we were. And the other habit that Adrian Zuckerberg had is he waved his arms when he was running. So here we were. Just like Emil Zuckerberg. But you know what? We had a fun time in those days imitating Emil Zuckerberg. But the reality is that most of us, not only at one time, but in all times, have the propensity to what? To imitate others. And the Bible recognizes that. And the Bible not only recognizes it, but it acknowledges for us the fact that we should indeed imitate not just one another, not just the cloud of witnesses, but we should imitate Jesus, our Lord and Savior. In fact, we are encouraged to only imitate him, no one else. Even when Paul writes in Philippians that we should imitate him, he immediately comes back to the fact that we, that he should, first of all, imitate and copy and make ourselves like Jesus rather than anyone else. And so we are to imitate. Therefore, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. All of these people, the writer of Hebrews says, of your great cloud of witnesses, let us also set aside every way. You see, the way we imitate, according to, Paul, according to the writer of Hebrews, probably wasn't Paul, according to the writer of Hebrews, the way we imitate is to lay aside, listen to this, if you would, every way and sin. You notice the difference here? The writer makes a distinction between that which is weighty and that which is sinful. We are not just to lay aside our sinfulness or our sin habits. We are also to lay aside anything that may hinder us in running the race the best way that we can. Now Paul may have had in mind the fact that in most of the races that were run in the Olympics, only men were allowed to run, only men were allowed to be spectators, because most of them wound up running naked. And so they would run, start that race, and before the race was over, they would throw off the clothing or other things that prevented them from winning the race. Here we are not just to lay aside sin, but the writer tells us to lay aside that which is causing us any kind of weight, that which is causing any of us to slow down and not accomplish the goals that we are to accomplish. There was a explorer, a famous explorer, in 1845 in Britain, who had took two sailing ships and 129 men, and they went out to find a passage through the Arctic Ocean. And as they were going on their mission, they got stuck in the ice, and all of them were killed. And one of the things that they discovered is that he, the owner, the leader of the, this, this exploration, Sir John Frederick, Sir John Frederick had taken with him a library on the ships of 1,200 books. He had fine silver and fine china that he had taken along. The entire trip and the boats that they were on, the ships that they were on, only two of them were filled with all of these, what, unnecessary things, weighty things, which caused them to slow down and in fact caused them not only to admire that's the right word in ice that caused them to be stuck in it to the point where they died. Before they died, they sent out various small groups, hoping that the small groups would survive and maybe find others. And one of the small groups that they found, they had gone on a, with a sled for 65 miles, and then both men had died. And when they uncovered the sled, they found it filled with the silver from the dining room and fine china. And books. You see, you and I can get weighed down, can't we? You and I can get so weighed down by the wonderful things in our lives that have so much meaning for us, that we desire so much or once desired so much. But what happens? We get stuck in the icy cold that sooner or later most of us will confront. 
So, we follow the cloud of witnesses and we lay aside every way we sin which clings so closely. And then let us run with endurance. Running with endurance. I've been reading a book by Alex Hutchinson on endurance. It's an interesting book because it defines endurance as the continuing struggle to come up against the mounting desire to stop. But at first hand, it sounds like a simple definition, and it is. But I think it speaks to us because many of us have had the experience where we have been in a race, perhaps in college, or high school, or in elementary school, and we find that as we are in the race, we find the desire to stop. No, I mean, how, Walter, have you ever had the desire to stop? Am I putting you on the spot? You know, on the spot? Okay, Walter is the only one because we are behind him who doesn't have the desire to stop. But most of us have the desire sooner or later to stop. Most of us who are human beings rather than gods like Walter have the, have the difficulty with uh, running a race from their obstacles. So, we have to be endure. But endure means what? Endure means not only self-discipline. Endure also means that we must have a goal. Most of the scientists who are studying criminology have concluded that most of the criminals lack two things in their life. The first thing that they lack is self-discipline. That is the willingness to give up immediate gratification. They are like, like me. I'm the making of a criminal. They, like me, would rather eat the cookie today than save it for tomorrow. Immediate gratification is what their, their gravestone will be on. Uh, the next time Mike gets out there with his team to level up the gravestones, maybe we'll see if there's somebody who's died in the air. He lacked for nothing because he was always immediately satisfied. So we have endurance, which comes from self-discipline, but also from having a purpose in life. If you don't have a purpose in life, and you don't have self-discipline, the likelihood is that we will never have anything. And we are called by God to endure the race. If you want to borrow this book, it's a great read. It's interesting material as well. So the first thing is we must imitate. We imitate by throwing off the weight, by knowing what is important, and by enduring in the race. There's more than that. In 1968, there was a man by the name of Alba Akawari. Akawari was a Tanzanian. And Akawari went into entered the marathon in the 1968 Olympics, which were held in Mexico City. And he was last. He wasn't just merely last. He was last by over an hour. People were waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And Akawari finally came into the stadium and ran where he was supposed to run and then basically fell apart because he had tremendous injuries and problems. And when they asked him the question, why is it that you continue in spite of all of your problems? Akabari said, my people in Mexico didn't send me to just start the race. They sent me to finish it. You see, you and I are not just called to start a race. You and I are not just called to begin the process of following our Lord. We are called to finish the race. Listen to the words, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You see, there has been a race set before us. As Michelle said, it is important for us to recognize that God has a plan for us. He has a plan for us to do good. He has a plan that has been set before us, which means that we are not just to begin the race, but we are to finish it. Looking to the founder and perfecter of our faith. So here we are, imitators, all Zatopek. I'm not going to ask you to stick your tongues out and imitate Zatopek, but you get the image. So from now on, if you ever see somebody with his tongue sticking out, or you see me with my tongue sticking out, we're practicing to be Zatopek. We should practice to be Christians as well. But not only that, we are to finish the race. 
this more. The third Olympic story that I want to tell you about is in 1992 at Barcelona, Spain. And in 1992, there was a British racer, not a marathon, but he was a 400 meter finisher of racing. His name was Derek Redmond. And Derek Redmond was a wonderful runner. He practiced all of his life, tried to get ready to run this race and to win the race. And just as he was coming around and qualifying now, his hamstring broke, snapped, and he was unable to finish the race, falling to the track. There was a gasp in the audience, the spectators. And then suddenly, there was a man who climbed over a retaining wall, jumped over the retaining wall, ran out before anyone could stop him, and took him by the arm, put his arm around his shoulders, and together, Derek Redman and Jim Redman, his father, finished the race. You see, we are to be imitators. We are to finish the race. But we are nowhere told in Scripture that we have to finish the race alone. The reality is that God will be there with us when we are in the midst of the race if we can only ask Him to be there with us. And that's why we are to look to Jesus as the perfecter of our faith. The reason we can do so, the reason we should do so, is because He will be there with us as our brother in the tribulations that all of us can face. Looking to Jesus. Perfected of all faith. Amen.